Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I hope uh, at this time things work better and I've been able to um, um, share my slides properly, not like the last time. So here I go. I'm going into the PowerPoint presentation and I'm going to start my slideshow. So today we are going to talk about uh, the golden images of Jahangir. And we start with uh, an excerpt that we know from a textual source of Mughal history that was written about a couple of hundred years after Jahangir's reign. And that is uh, by the historian Khafi Khan. And uh, the, the title of his uh, text is Munda Khab Tabarik. In that, we see that there is a mention, particularly for the sixth year of reign, he says that Jahangir gave orders that a piece of gold weighing one tola be stamped on one side with the image of the Padishah and displaying on the other the figure or surat of a lion surmounted by a sun. And these were to be given to favorite amirs or most devoted servants. And they were to wear respectfully on the sash of the turban on or on the breast front as a life preserving amulet or in Farsi it's called Harzejan. Then again, in the second paragraph, a few um, pay, um, pages or paragraphs down, he says, again, makes mentions to this, this particular system that uh, this, this particular piece was uh, given to these people and they might bind it on their turbans and it would both exalt their dignity and add to the beauty of their headdress. Um, some people threw it around their necks and wore it as a life-preserving amulet on the breast front. And then he mentions that uh, in the 21st year of his reign, which is pretty late after the sixth year, the emperor gave orders that the portrait pieces, or shabis as he's called them, should be made larger, or five tolas this time, and it should be given to especially uh, favored amirs. Um, we don't have, unfortunately, any examples of uh, the five tola pieces uh, surviving, but the surviving examples of the one Tola pieces are exactly what um, Hafi Khan mentions them to be. And here is an example from the British Museum's collection. And here you see a fantastic, um, superbly engraved portrait of uh, Jahangir looking to left um, against the backdrop of a sun. So he's shown in an imbate position. Um, the inscription to the right, uh, gives his regnal year, uh, Julius uh, Sana VI, or Shash. And the inscription on the left reads, Shabi Jahangir uh, Shah Akbar Shah. So it's, of course, it's, it's, it refers to this particular uh, depiction as uh, a likeness or Shabi. Um, and on the reverse, uh, as Khafi Khan described, there is the emblem of uh, the lion surmounted by a rising sun. Below that, we have the mention of the Hijra year uh, 1020, which uh, is in Sana Hijri 1020. So these were the kind of amulets uh, or pieces that, that Jahangir had struck to be given to his favorite Amirs. Apart from Khafi Khan, we also do have a very interesting contemporary account of what these pieces were meant to be and how they were actually given. And this comes from the diary of Sir Thomas Rowe. Sir Thomas Rowe was um, an ex-Oxford man, uh, uh, educated in Magdalen College, and um, he was a very important, uh, well, he started his life as the son of a sort of uh, a, a, um, aristocratic or semi-aristocratic uh, family, in, and then sort of grows, um, rose to become a very important diplomat. So he, apart from coming to India on a diplomatic mission, which was sent uh, for, um, he was sent for representing in the court of Jahangir. Um, he also had diplomatic missions to Guyana. He was surveying Amazon for the first time. Then he uh, was sent to the Ottoman court. And then finally, towards the end of his life, uh, he also served as a, a kind of an emissary to bring peace to a war that was happening between Sweden and Poland. 
So a very important um, figure in terms of diplomatic uh, history as such, but also very interesting, a coin collector. And we have records that after his death, 242 coins belonging to his collection were given by his wife to the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Here we see him uh, in two sort of uh, fashions. One is a kind of typical British portrait of him, but on the left-hand side, you see him in a miniature painting, and this is from the British Museum's collection. And this, is, this painting is actually describing as um, a subject as uh, the Jahangir, uh, Emperor Jahangir actually is receiving somebody in his court. But there you see in the group on the left-hand side, amongst the crowd is possibly the representation of uh, Thomas Rowe. Very interestingly, look at what he's doing. Everybody else is trying to uh, bring presents to the emperor. So there's a court scene happening. You know, there are people carrying uh, thalis of, of gifts. There is a guy who's carrying, carrying a hawk. So Thomas Rowe, very interestingly, is taking notes. And that's what he was doing. And um, we know that he accompanied a Jahangir um, for two or three years. Soon after his arrival in the court at Agra, Jahangir decided to move uh, his court to Ajmer. And that was because he intended to pursue a campaign against uh, the, the Ranas of Mewar. And that's why he was wanted to place, place himself at Ajmer. So we have an entry in Sir, Franz, Sir Thomas Rowe's diary that on August the 17th, 1616, um, he goes to visit the king. And um, what happens is very interesting. So as, as soon as he comes in, the king calls to his woman and um, reaches out a picture of him set in gold. And this picture of him set in gold is hanging at a wire gold chain with a pearl sort of uh, decoration around it. And this particular piece, he gives this to Asaf Khan. Asaf Khan was a very important courtier. Asaf Khan then comes to Sir Thomas Rowe and he gives the token to him. And then he suggests that he should take off his hat and put this particular piece of, um, of um, bearing the picture of Jahangir around his neck. And then he was led before the king. So when he came to the king, he was already wearing this pendant with uh, the picture of, the, of Jahangir on it. Um, Asaf Khan then says to uh, Thomas Rowe, say thanks to the king, which he does. And he says that I did it in my own language, probably English, or own custom. And some other officers who were present there told him to do a sizda or sajda, which is the Mughal uh, custom of prostration. The person uh, arriving in front of the king should actually prostrate himself in, in, as a mark of um, uh, honor and respect. But the king says, no, 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 don't do it. Don't do it. That's, that's, that's too much. You know, it's fine, fine. You're, you're all right. And then he goes to say that the gift that, that he was given me was not worth in all 30 livres. And yet it was five times as good as anything that he can give in that kind, because it was a special favor. And all the great men that wear this king's image receive nothing but uh, uh, this, this medal of gold as big as sixpence with a little chain of four inches and it's fastening their heads. But it's quite interesting that he says that none may do but to whom it is given, except the people who actually were given this, nobody was allowed to use these particular pendants um, as, as a mark of respect. Um, so what, was, what, was, what, is, what is such a big deal about this? I mean, why, why would anyone uh, use this particular piece of gold, one tola in weight with a picture of Jahangir um, as a mark of respect? And why, why, was it, why did it carry such a lot of weight? So we have to see this in context of how the actual seeing or sighting of the emperor was um, conducted in the context of the Mughal court. It was not a joke to see the emperor. It was, it was quite a privilege and an honor to see actually go and see and meet the pers uh, emperor personally. Of course, there were opportunities of public sighting. And one of them was the ceremony of Darshan that um, actually started by Humayun, but popularized by Akbar quite a lot. And this happened usually in the morning at a specific window or balcony, which was called a Jaroka. And uh, 
the king appeared there uh, at, at sunrise and gave sort of his visage to the crowd that had assembled down below. And um, this, was, this was kind of a ritual that happened uh, practically every day, really, and uh, most of the days. Um, Jahangir was, was uh, not really fond of getting very up in the morning. Uh, he, was, he was a man of leisure and luxury. He, he was easily given to passions, as we shall see in, in a minute. But um, he woke up, he got dressed, he showed himself to the public, and then came back and went to bed again for a couple of hours, which was perfectly all right for him. Then there were semi-private sightings. And I say semi-private because not everybody was allowed in these kind of enclosures where people could see him. And a good example of what I call as semi-private sightings was the emperor at court. And in court, only certain people were allowed, which were courtiers or people who had business to do, petitioners maybe. Clergy often was allowed to attend courts because of uh, particular uh, religious uh, injunctions or uh, orders or interpretations that, uh, that they were uh, required to give. And there might be other attendees such as um, emissaries and sometimes even servants who would bring back forth um, presents and things like that. About this, there was a level of private audience and um, these were really, really uh, cat's whiskers as it were. Um, they were given usually in private quarters and sometimes people were allowed or invited to garden or drinking parties. And this was usually a very close inner circle of the emperor's confidants and courtiers that was allowed to do that. Jangi's garden parties and drinking parties were legendary, I must say. And quite interestingly, he held them on a Thursday, which is today, really. And um, the fun part is that uh, Friday was the day of prayers and usually penitence. Um, so typically, Thursday was the day of merrymaking. And so Sir Thomas Rowe was also invited to a garden party and he has written a fantastic account of how this drinking party went uh, and how he was given a, a, a spirit that was too strong for him. And when he drank, he sneezed and everybody laughed and this kind of very absolutely jolly kind of description of his drinking parties. So what does this, this, all this mean is that this particular favor that the emperor extended upon these favorite people by giving him a token of what he looked like, the likeness of Shabi allowed the recipient to see the emperor at his own will because he actually had it with him all the time or he could just pull it, pull it out and see the emperor. So this was a kind of an indexical way of looking at emperor, a kind of token way of looking at emperor. And this is the, this is the kind of grace and favor the emperor is conferring on you. And uh, of course, uh, Khafi Khan mentions that he also, uh, these these things were also worn to have protective powers. And this is a very old concept that king's bodies were full of protective powers. They were anything that was touched by king would have specific powers. And we, had, we see this, this custom practically in many cultures, way, lots of cultures. In Britain, we had the system of touch pieces where gold coins, which were touched by the king, were worn to alleviate from symptoms of diseases such as glandular tuberculosis. And um, in India, of course, there was uh, other rituals like the emperor would send his coat or, or, or his um, uh, angaracha uh, as a kind of gift to a person that would then he would then ceremonially wear it. And this was something that the, it's, it's like symbolically suggesting that he has become the emperor's body. The emperor has embraced him in a way by sending him his own coat. And of course, uh, as we see that people actually used it as a status symbol. And this was displayed as a mark of socio-political climbing in the court. They just it's indicate to other people that look, here I am, I am the favorite of the emperor. So this, is, this, was, this was one other purpose that these particular uh, medal, uh, uh, um, shabis uh, um, uh, were, were used for. The origins of this practice actually are in Akbar's ritual of initiation into the Ilahi community or Tohi the Ilahi as he called. And we have a clear reference to this uh, by none other than Abdul Qadir Badayuni, the, the chronicler of Akbar's reign. And he mentions that this particular initiation to the divine community or Ilahi community happened on the day of Nowruz. And 
for the Nowruz of the Islamic year 993, he mentions uh, in his account that several courtiers embraced the divine community, swearing a total allegiance to the emperor, inclusive of life, reputation, religion, and property. This was all given to the emperor as, 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 his, as the kind of master. In return, um, he gave them a shabi, a likeness. And they looked on it as in the standard of loyal friendship and the advance guard of righteousness and happiness. And they put it wrapped in, up in a jeweled case on the top of their turban. So this is exactly how uh, the Akbar's uh, uh, shabis were being used. We unfortunately don't have any exa surviving examples of Akbar's own shabis used by Akbar or struck by Akbar. But we do have a piece, a unique piece uh, in the British Museum's collection where uh, an Akbar likeness uh, issued during the first year of Jah Jahangir's reign is, uh, is, uh, is, is known. The surviving examples of these gold uh, images of Jahangir um, are of four, four types, and each of them, we can classify them in, with the reference to their regnal years. So the, in the first thing, the regnal year six, when Khafi Khan mentions it, we, as we saw, it has a bust uh, and a lion on the rivers, but there is no mention of a mint name, but in all probability, these pieces were probably struck at Agra. For regnal year seven, we have a full length portrait, not just a bust. I'll show you this in a minute. There again, there is no mint mentioned, possibly struck at Agra, but what is very interesting is that the number regnal year seven pieces are only known as a quarter mohawk. Then Jahangir moves to Ajmer, and there we have two uh, issues, regnal year eight and regnal year nine, and both are uh, with a full length portrait, and both feature uh, Farsi couplets on them. Um, here is a second example where the reverse is also regnal year six, bus type, and the reverse has the lion looking the other way, looking, looking to the right. We saw the first coin, the lion was looking to the left, here it looks to the right, again from the collection of the British Museum. Uh, same inscription, Shabi Jahangir Shah Akbar Shah on the right, on the left, and uh, uh, regnal year six, Julius on, on the right. There are some kind of variations on the theme in this portrait and people who have published extensively on these coins such as uh, uh, Shapur Johormas Jihodiwala have discussed it uh, in great detail and have made lots of uh, suggestions about what this means. So for the regnal year six portraits we have three variations. One is where Jahangir is placed, placing his hand on a kind of balustrade in front of him and there is a little piece, a rectangular piece that, that he sets his fingers on, that you see on the left uh, image here. In the right image, you see him holding a little ball in his hand. Um, but the most famous of his Ringelier six portraits is the one which is in the middle here on, against the black backdrop. And here we see him holding uh, a cup. Now, this has been widely regarded as a, a portrait with a wine cup. And uh, of course, uh, Jahangir's penchant for uh, alcohol is absolutely well documented. He himself writes it, that he was consuming huge amounts of uh, spirits every day. And um, ultimately, uh, towards the end of his reign, he became so um, um, given to the passion of alcohol and, and merrymaking that he appointed his queen, Nur Jahan, as uh, the the kind of um, uh, you know the plenipotentiary uh, a ruler in her own right uh, and he sort of retired uh, very happily uh, giving all to his passions. Um, this particular uh, uh, image of Jahangir is has caused uh, a lot of interest and absolutely correctly because there are other portraits which we know from the repertoire of Mughal miniature painting which show Jahangir with his favorite, uh, uh, you know, object, which is his drinking cup. So here are details of two uh, such pictures, both from the collection of Freer Sackler in Washington, DC. And here you see him actually carrying this particular crystal or um, a small drinking cup in his hand. Um, uh, so, so it's an image of having Jahangir having this drinking cup in his hand was very much in circulation and very much uh, met the, the person's approval. The same theme continues in the later portraits, which are full-length portraits, and here we see them here. 
Um, the Regnalier 7 Quarter Mohor portraits shows him uh, full length, seated on a kind of a masnad or a, a throne, uh, against reclining against a bolster. Um, and again, all these three portraits, which are which show him in full length, also have this goblet-looking uh, like object in his hand. The first issue at Ajmer, uh, which was probably the one that was given to uh, Sir Thomas Rowe, who knows, we don't know exactly, but probably this was the one, shows him um, again reclining against a big bolster. And um, the inscription is verse inscription on its uh, sort of goes around from 12 o'clock and it reads Barue Sikka Zadad Chandin Zenat Ozevar. Shabiya Shah Nuruddin Jahangir Ibn Shah Akbar. Similarly, the Regnalier 9 portrait that you see on the right side is a full length portrait, but here we see the proper octagonal Mughal throne uh, in its, all its details. And again, Jahangir is reclining against a bolster, seated cross legged, holding this little goblet in his hand. And here the couplet reads Kiza e bar sikka e zar kard taswir. Shabi Hazrat Shah Jahangir. Here, the reference is to destiny. It means Kida is destiny. And it says, it's destiny who has made this likeness, this, this, um, this uh, taswir, the, the figure, in the likeness of Hazrat Venerable Shah Jahangir. And this is very interesting because uh, there is um, room to believe that uh, at just, just before this coin was struck, uh, Jahangir was. Uh, uh, overcome with an illness and uh, he was very very ill for about a couple of months in that illness he he uh, begged for health to uh, the great Sufi saint Khaja Muhinuddin Cheshti whose shrine is at Akbar uh, at Ajmer and uh, when he was cured he uh, went in a procession to the, the, to the shrine and perform the act of piercing his ears in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of indication of uh, um, accepting discipleship. And this was a very unusual thing for a Mughal emperor to do because uh, piercing ears was uh, usually associated with being Hindus and also um, was not a very Islamic practice. So, but that's what Jahangir did. So here we are, so this is, this is the kind of uh, the, the portraits that we have. Um, so, to um, end the presentation, I would just like to summarize the likenesses of Jahangir, what do they tell us? Because the question of what are they? What, what exactly are they? Are they coins? Are they amulets? Are they medallions? Or are they shabis, as the inscriptions on themselves uh, clearly say? Shabi is, is just a likeness. Um, I doubt whether they were actually circulating as currency because they were objects of very high status. Indeed, a lot of coins, a lot of surviving examples that we know uh, have been taken off from a mound that, that indicated that they were put into jewelry at one point. Uh, they were certainly being used as amulets, we know that, because people were using them as harzejan, uh, as life-preserving uh, tokens. The word medallion, I'm personally not very happy about because that sort of has a kind of uh, um, a Eurocentric uh, interpretation on it. Uh, but it was it has been used to to describe these these pieces in the past. <laughs> of course, there's a lot of discussion about what is called as the Bacchanalian image because he's drinking and merrymaking. But is he really drinking? And is that really a wine cup? These are real questions that we have to answer. And in a recent publication, uh, which will come out quite soon, I hope, inshallah. Uh, I have argued that it is not exactly that he's shown he's showing himself as drinking. And the cup is actually rather, um, um, you know, it could be any other cup as well. Um, it would be quite uh, uh, tall to uh, expect uh, him to actually show him on, a, on, on an object of such a high status in uh, uh, an act which was uh, actively despised by a lot of his uh, courtiers and also his subjects. This is, of course, these uh, golden tokens are a unique numismatic instance but we have parallels of these depictions in other um, um, modes of expression in Mughal art, such as the cameo portraits, uh, miniatures, and certain bas reliefs as well. This is 
uh, they are definitely a testimony to the emperor's deep interest in his coinage. I mean, I, I use the word coinage here, even though they're not exactly coins, because they are struck to a monetary standard. And they're also, of course, a testimony to his vanity. Uh, Jiangi was a, a, a superbly vainglorious person, as we know. The execution of these pictures is, an, is, a, is a testimony to the art of the engravers uh, and in uh, the Mughal court. And it is indeed comparable to the high Mughal miniature style. Indeed, you can draw uh, direct comparisons between these engraved images and, uh, 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 and painted images of, of Jahangir. The objects as such are very deeply set in historic contexts of Jahangir's reign, both in terms of textual evidence and as visual evidence. Uh, they, are, they, they continue to be an in, in, inseparable part of uh, Jahangir's um, uh, evidence that we have on hand. And uh, indeed, they are pieces of great historical uh, um, interest and, and, uh, and beauty in, 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 in general. So thanks a lot for listening to this. Uh, I will be back uh, on Sunday with a much longer presentation when we will talk about uh, the evolution and genesis and consumption of the image of Paratmata and what do numismatic objects tell us about that. So we'll look forward to see you all on Sunday. Till then, goodbye and good luck. Keep safe, keep happy, keep busy. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.